This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Groom to Die, the Kensia Children, the first ever Suffer the Little Children podcast miniseries. I'm your host, Lane, and this is part six, House of Cards. Over the past five episodes, I've told you about the many acts of child abuse allegedly perpetrated by Susan Lee, including her murder charges for the deaths of her two adopted infant sons, 28 years of medical abuse of her younger daughter physical and mental cruelty toward her daughters and stepsons, and maltreatment of a number of children she babysat. I also told you a little about Susan's alleged abuse of her third adopted child. In this episode, I'll tell you more about Susan's treatment of her adopted daughter and what happened once DSS finally got involved. I'll also tell you how Susan's biological daughters, Christy and Shane, reunited after over a decade and began putting the pieces together revealing the enormity of Susan's decades-long reign of terror. This is Part 6, House of Cards. I'd like to take a moment to thank my newest patrons, Karen F. from Albany, New York, Wendy S. from Champlin, Minnesota, Mary S. from Tiverton, Rhode Island, Megan F. from Nicholasville, Kentucky, Julie E. from Reston, Virginia, and Danielle M. from Whoville, Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your support. I honestly couldn't keep this podcast going without you. With that, let's get right into it. By January of 2022, Shane Kenzia, who had no contact with any of her family members for over 13 years, was shocked to receive a message from her stepbrother, John Christopher Lee, who was in Jordan with the military at the time. In his message, John told Shane that Susan was in hospice care, dying. When they finally connected by phone, Shane asked John what was wrong with Susan, and he responded, When she ran out of people to make sick, she started doing it to herself. On January 26th, Shane received a Facebook message request from her sister, Christy. It had been 14 years since they last spoke. In her message, Christy wrote, Hey, I know you probably don't want to hear from me but I feel like I need to let you know that Mama is at the end. I don't know how much longer she has. She is sleeping 98% of the day and has not eaten since Saturday. It's not my intention to start anything at all. I just want you to know. Shane didn't respond right away. In fact, she had to think it over for some time. Everything that ever happened to her and all the other children Susan had hurt weighed heavily on Shane's mind. Finally, she decided she needed the closure only seeing Susan in that condition could provide. She needed to tell her mother that despite everything Susan had done to her, Shane forgave her. On February 4, 2022, Shane drove five hours from her home in Virginia to Rock Hill, South Carolina. As she was nearing town, she realized how much she needed moral support and reached out to an old family friend, her ex-girlfriend, Jamie Hunt. Jamie was surprised to hear from Shane after so many years of not talking, but when Shane told her that Susan was apparently dying, Jamie immediately volunteered to go with her to say her goodbyes. In the meantime, Jamie also reached out to Shane's sister, Christy, to whom she also hadn't spoken in years. In the past, Jamie acted as sort of a buffer between Christy and Shane, who, you'll remember from previous episodes, had always had an adversarial relationship and had been wary of communicating with each other even before they stopped talking altogether. Their contentious relationship stemmed from Susan's manipulation throughout their entire lives. She would tell Christy a story one way and twist the details differently when she told it to Shane, pitting the two against each other. She even told them that Christy was a planned pregnancy, but Shane was the product of Susan's first husband, Doug, raping her and getting her pregnant. 
Shane considered Christy the golden child who was rarely ill, often praised in front of the other children, although rarely to her face, and considered normal. Christy resented Shane for needing more care than the rest of the kids and for needing more of their mother's time and attention because she was the sick one. Because of Shane's constant illnesses, Christy felt pressure to be perfect. Over the years, Susan had convinced Christy that Shane was nothing but a liar, a drug addict, a manipulator, and mentally ill. Thanks to Susan, the two were never able to build a sisterly bond. On February 5, 2022, Shane and Jamie arrived at Susan's house, where Christy, her husband Mike, and their three children lived, along with Susan's adopted daughter, K.L., who was by that time 11. Susan was also living there at the time, albeit on home hospice care. Shane was terrified to come face-to-face with both Christy and Susan, but having Jamie there bolstered her confidence. When they arrived, Shane, Jamie, and Christy sat on the porch while waiting for a visitor of Susan's to leave. As the three of them talked, Christy broke down in tears, telling her sister and Jamie that Susan was a horrible person who had made her life a living hell for years. She confessed that she had installed cameras in the home to protect her own children, especially from any possible allegations Susan might make that the family was mistreating her or failing to care for her. Knowing how manipulative her mother was, Christy knew she couldn't leave any margin for error. Hearing this, Shane was elated because it meant Christy saw Susan for what she really was. At that moment, Shane realized that her sister had been living a parallel nightmare to the one Shane had for all those years. In light of this realization, all the resentment and even hate Shane had for her sister began to redirect toward their mother where it belonged. As it turned out, Christy and Shane had more in common than they thought. After everything they'd been through, they both avoid hospitals, doctors, medications, and any contact with sickness if at all possible. For her part, Christy's bond with Susan was a trauma bond, more like Stockholm Syndrome than a mother-daughter relationship. Christy lived under Susan's thumb for most of her life. Shane, on the other hand, had lived for years knowing that no one believed her when she told them her story. Even though she knew her mother had been making her sick since birth, Shane was accused by others of being a drama queen, a liar, a manipulator, and worse. Both Christy and Shane have various mental and behavioral diagnoses, but the one they share prominently is post-traumatic stress, for obvious reasons. This wasn't the first time Christy had an inkling that something was off about her mother's past. Around 1999, when Christy was around 21, she was temporarily estranged from her mother when she got curious about the death of her two adopted infant brothers, Michael and Kevin, in the mid-1980s. All along, Susan had told her that both of her brothers died from SIDS, but things weren't adding up in Christie's mind. She ended up meeting with Charlie Phelps, the Smithfield police detective who investigated Michael and Kevin's deaths in 1985 and 1986, and who ultimately retired as Isle of Wight County Sheriff. When they met, Phelps gave Christy the police file on her brother's case. She held on to it, but sometime over the years, she misplaced the file, and she squelched her suspicions about her mother for many years. Finally, however, on that day on the porch in February of 2022, one look into Christy's eyes told Shane everything she needed to know. Her sister knew the truth. Shane, Christy, and Jamie sat on the porch for a while, discussing Susan's years of misdeeds. They talked about how Shane hadn't been wrong about what happened to her, about what happened to Michael and Kevin, and about her belief that Aaron McKee was not the one who beat little BG in Susan's in-home daycare all those years before. When Susan's visitor finally left, Shane entered the house, stealing herself for her first glimpse of Susan in 14 years. She remembered being a little girl and thinking of her mother as if she was Superman. As a teenager, Shane saw Susan as a larger-than-life monster. Both images in her mind were of a powerful, terrifying being who could do anything she wanted, get away with anything she wanted, and cause chaos and agony wherever she went. Pausing in the doorway to Susan's room, Shane was struck by how weak, wasted, and pathetic her now white-haired mother looked. Where was the Superman of her childhood? Where was the monster who terrified her as a teenager? Although she didn't say it aloud, all she could think was, What the fuck happened to you? Needless to say, Susan was more than a little surprised to see Shane after many years of no contact. During the visit, 
Susan gave Shane a hug, and Shane vividly remembers her skin crawling at the moment Susan touched her. During the hug, Shane was so disgusted and afraid that she felt nauseous and couldn't hold back the tears that spilled from her eyes. Susan told her daughter she loved her, but Shane couldn't bring herself to return the sentiment. At one point during the visit, Susan got sick and began throwing up, but instead of staying by her mother's bedside, Shane stood and took a step back, watching as Susan suffered through her vomiting episode. She wanted to but didn't ask Susan how it felt to choke, vomit, and gasp for air because that was how she made Shane feel for almost 30 years of her life. There was something incredibly cathartic about seeing this once powerful person reduced to a weak, pathetic waste of a human being. I'll pause here for a quick sponsor break. After that visit to Rock Hill in early February, Shane returned a number of times over the next several weeks, spending time frequently with Christy, Susan, Christy's family, and sometimes Jamie. During this time, Susan grew more and more sickly, her recent onset dementia seeming to grow more profound while she remained on hospice care in the home she shared with Christy's family. Meanwhile, Christy also began looking into her mother's past again. When she went through all of the medical documentation and newspaper articles Susan had held on to, Christy realized that Shane hadn't just been a liar, a manipulator, and a drug addict for all those years. Susan really had been making Shane sick since birth. During one of Shane's visits toward the end of February, Christy told Shane that she had something to show her. She had saved a couple of large tote boxes on the porch that Susan told her to throw away, so she and Shane began going through them. In the boxes was a large amount of documentation Susan had saved over the years from medical records to police reports to multiple copies of Shane's social security card and birth certificate. Some of the medical records were original handwritten documents from medical providers that it appeared Susan had taken directly from Shane's medical chart. The crown jewel of Susan's collection, however, was an item Christy found in the wardrobe beside Susan's bed. There's no other way to describe this otherwise nondescript binder than to call it Susan's trophy binder. For anyone who's seen the 1990 movie adaptation of Stephen King's novel Misery with Kathy Bates and James Caan, the first thing I thought of when I heard about and later saw photos of this binder was the photo album where Annie Wilkes kept newspaper articles, including clippings detailing her Angel of Death murder trial. Susan Lee's trophy binder also contained a treasure trove of damning documentation, including 13 double-sided pages of photocopied newspaper clippings about Susan's murder trial. Each page was encased in a plastic sleeve, and along with the copy, the original clipping of each article was sealed in a dated envelope. The binder also contained court documents, Michael and Kevin's autopsy reports and other medical documentation about the boys, reports from the hospital and the rescue squad, the letter reporter Anita Lee wrote to Susan in jail, a transcript of Susan's 1985 interview with the Smithfield police, the defense's witness list, and various other mementos from Susan's trial for the murders of her two adopted infant sons. Emboldened by the frankly insane amount of documentation they found, Christy and Shane began speaking with others who were related to their life story in one way or another, looking for answers to some of their lingering questions and trying to make sense of it all. On February 10, 2022, the sisters, along with their friend Jamie, had a Zoom video call with Anita Lee, the newspaper reporter who covered Susan's trial decades before. Anita, who remembered the murder trial as what she called a very strange case, was shocked to hear what Susan's daughters had to say. Anita told them that she had once spoken with Susan in person, which she said was very unusual for murder suspects. Anita said she actually liked Susan, although she felt there was definitely something wrong with the woman and suspected she had done something to her adopted sons. Anita also wondered if Susan may have somehow convinced herself the baby's deaths were not her fault. Anita said that after Prosecutor Parker Counsel mentioned Munchausen syndrome by proxy in his opening argument, she was surprised nothing else on the topic came up during the trial, and equally surprised that Counsel never called an expert on the subject to testify. After Anita corroborated their suspicions and feelings about Susan, Christy and Shane pushed forward in their search for the truth. On February 17, 
Chief Alonzo Howell of the Smithfield Police Department in Virginia responded to an online inquiry Christie sent about Susan's case file regarding Michael and Kevin's murders. Chief Howell wrote, Good morning, Ms. Robbins. I am writing you in regards to your request for information from a case that occurred back in 1986. We have checked our records and was not able to locate a case file from 1986. The oldest records we were able to locate only went back as far as 1989. Please feel free to contact the department if we can be of any further assistance. Christie also spoke with the Isle of Wight County Court Clerk, who tried to locate the records for the murder case. The clerk did find the file, but it was empty except for one piece of paper mentioning Gloria Wilson, the social worker who helped Susan and Tom Kenzia adopt Michael in 1985 and Kevin in 1986. The clerk told Christie the nearly empty file was unusual because the court kept records going back over 200 years. It seems impossible that when Christie asked former Detective Charlie Phelps for the case file in 1999, he handed over the original case file without so much as making a copy, but nevertheless, the original Smithfield police file from Susan's murder investigation seems to have vanished without a trace. The empty court file as well makes the whole situation even stranger. On March 8, 2022, Shane spoke with a former Charleston physician's assistant who worked with one of her childhood doctors. The woman admitted that she and the doctor, who only saw Shane for a short time when she was a teenager, had their own suspicions about Susan, but nothing solid enough to report. Since the age of about 14, right before I actually started seeing you in Charleston, I always had the suspicion that my mother was making me sick. Um, Um, I think we also wondered that as a medical team. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, probably weren't aware of the history, but the history is whenever I was five years old, Susan was arrested for two counts of murder for two infant baby boys, and Munchausen was brought up then and nobody came to check on the kids she had at the house. Off and on, I'd be doing okay. There was never really ever a diagnosis. I actually have been, could not remember your name for the life of me, but I remembered, (laughs) I remembered you. And, and because of all the many doctors that I saw, I didn't like a lot of them. And you were the one of the ones that actually acted like you listened to me not just Susan, I found your card, your old MUSC card, and and a book, and it had your name on it, and I said, that's her, that's her, that's her. I called, I called the number instantly, and, you know, the guy had been there for five years and hadn't heard of you, and I needed to know your opinion, because it made no sense. We, Dr. Wilson and I, um, who has since passed away, we had several conversations as to what was going on because we couldn't figure out what was going on and there seemed to be some strangeness you know nothing that i could really lay my hands on that that was the problem and you know we didn't see you long enough in the scheme of things, you know, it wasn't like you were a 10, 15 year patient. Cause she switched me. She would take yeah. me to different places so nobody would catch on. We found actual doctors stuff that she had been taking, taken out of my medical file to oh. compile her own sick, twisted version yeah. of events. But I had a conversation with her last night and let her know that she made a mistake because the timeline that she typed up and the conditions that she said that I was in didn't match the pictures of the baby she took. I remember she had pretty detailed records when she came. Yeah. Or, or you know, lists of everything that had been done and she was just pushing and pushing for more studies. And I, I just... Um, Boy, I, I would love to go back and read that stuff, you know, in, at MUSC, but I, you know, I don't have any access to anything, in, you know, now that I'm retired. So, it, and, I, and I don't know what was documented, just because, you know, Dr. Wilson and I talked about things doesn't mean we ever wrote anything about suspicions in there. You have to be very careful when you're documenting. On March 19th, 
Christy and Shane met with former Detective Phelps, who headed the 1986 investigation into Michael's and Kevin's murders and interviewed Susan in October of 1985. He remembered some details about the case, but most of his input during their meeting involved reaching out to St. Luke's Memorial Park Cemetery to help Christy and Shane locate their brother's graves. However, multiple times throughout the conversation, Phelps promised to reach out to former prosecutor Parker Counsel and several others on their behalf to find more information for them. After making these promises, the Kenzia sisters heard from Charlie Phelps only once more in a strangely curt email he sent to Christie on March 31st. The email read, Good afternoon, Ms. Robbins. Hope you have gotten the results you are looking for. I have no additional information for you at this time. Good luck to you and your sister in getting closure to this. Bless you. Another email Christie sent to Phelps in September remains unanswered. After meeting with Phelps in March, the same day, Christy and Shane visited St. Luke's Memorial Park for the first time in over 30 years to visit the final resting places of their brothers, Michael Thomas Kenzia and Kevin Ryan Kenzia, who were buried side by side. As I mentioned in the last episode, Michael had a headstone, but Kevin did not. Since then, we've raised the funds to have a headstone made for Kevin, and Christy and Shane approved the final design last week. It may take up to eight months to produce and install, but I'll keep you updated on the podcast's Facebook page. Thank you so much to everyone who donated. After leaving the cemetery, Christy and Shane dropped by the home of their godparents, Mike and Lynn Peters, who hadn't seen the girls since around 1986. In fact, they last heard from Susan in the 90s when she came by with her then new husband, John Lee. Lynn and Mike were stunned to hear what Christy and Shane had to say and lamented not seeing Susan for who she really was. Lynn told the sisters a story about one time Susan visited shortly after Lynn and Mike had their first child, a son. During that visit, the baby wouldn't stop crying, so Susan decided to pick him up and take him for a walk up the street. This was unsettling to Lynn, although she couldn't lay a finger on exactly why. Something told her she needed to go get her baby from Susan. By the time she caught up with them, Susan had walked the baby almost to the end of the block. Lynn had no idea why she was so bothered by Susan walking away with her infant, but she remembered that feeling clearly as she recounted the incident to Christy and Shane. On March 22, 2022, Susan, who was by all appearances on her deathbed, discovered her trophy binder was missing from the wardrobe beside her bed. Earlier, I mentioned that Christy had installed indoor and outdoor surveillance cameras to protect herself, her husband, and her children from Susan's baseless accusations of abuse or neglect. Well, those cameras captured video of Susan walking through the kitchen with her little dog in her arms, looking pretty spry for a woman supposedly on the verge of death. In the video, she even left the house, walking across the porch and down the steps toward her mother Betty's house, which is on the same property. Later, when asked about this, Susan explained, I waited for Christy to leave, and I escaped. For the record, no one was holding Susan captive, medicating her beyond what her doctors had prescribed, or otherwise mistreating her. The catalyst for her daring escape was not mistreatment by her family, but the realization that her daughters had found her trophy binder. After this incident, Susan was hospitalized for her failing health and deepening dementia. Two days after Susan's so-called escape, Shane drove back to Rock Hill from her home in Virginia. She had only $56 in her pocket and half a tank of gas in her car, but she was overcome with the need to stop Susan from constantly disrupting Christy and her family's lives, as she had done for far too long already. On the way, Shane pondered the idea of trying to foster some kind of mother-daughter relationship with Susan, which was something they'd truly never had. By the time she arrived at the hospital, Shane almost had herself convinced she could be kind and loving to the monster mom who had gone through great lengths to destroy her in every way possible. Over the next several days, Shane spent a good deal of time at Susan's bedside, discussing both the past and the present with the woman who bore no physical resemblance to the strong, strapping, imposing monster from Shane's youth. Susan made a number of eyebrow-raising statements, even some startling confessions, but we'll get deeper into those a little bit later. During this visit to South Carolina, Shane reconnected with her best friend from the sixth grade, Rachel. 
Susan had destroyed Shane and Rachel's friendship with her lies many years before, so Shane was, and is, relieved to have Rachel back in her life and in her corner. To date, Shane's last conversation with Susan took place in the hospital on March 30th, 2022. After this, Shane left in tears, heading back to Virginia after making a vow to herself that she would never speak to her mother again. Meanwhile, Christy, who became her mother's durable power of attorney after having Susan declared incompetent, managed to find placement for Susan in an assisted living facility around the end of April. Susan, for the record, was in full agreement with the idea. Christy would sign over Susan's disability checks to the facility for payment, and Susan would only be allowed to leave the premises if a relative signed her out. Within days of Susan's placement, her brother, Gene Stevenson, showed up at the care facility and made a scene, yelling and swearing at the staff until they handed over Susan's ID and belongings. He then immediately took Susan to an attorney's office and had the power of attorney revoked. Jean did not have the legal authority to do any of this because Susan had already been declared incompetent, but the attorney made it happen nonetheless. Next, Jean and Susan went to the police station. It's unknown exactly what they told the police, but they managed to secure a police escort to Susan's house to pick up some of her things. While they were there, Susan told Christy to pack a bag for K.L., Susan's adopted 11-year-old daughter, who Susan said was coming with her. Since K.L. would no longer be in the home, Christy had no reason to stay there, so she told Susan they'd be moving out. With Jean and the police right there listening, Susan told Christy she wasn't asking them to leave, but Christy insisted, and she and her husband put down a deposit on an apartment the same day. Within days, they were served with eviction papers ordering them to leave Susan's house, despite Susan's insistence that she wasn't asking them to leave. Fortunately, Christy and her family moved into their apartment at the beginning of May. They did not give Susan their address. The first few weeks went by with an uneasy sort of peace, but it was just as short-lived as to be expected. Before long, K.L. called family friend Jamie and said she was being cussed at all the time and her uncle Jean was hitting her. On top of that, K.L. said, Susan had put her on two new medications, but K.L. didn't know what they were or what they were for and Susan put them away up high so K.L. couldn't read the labels. Jamie immediately reported the abuse to DSS and let Christy and Shane know what was going on. They also made reports to DSS. On May 29, 2022, Susan left the following voicemail for Christy. Hey, Christy, this is Susan. If you want give me a call back as soon as possible. Otherwise, she's going into foster care. The same day, Susan and Christy had the following text exchange. Susan. This is Susan. Do you want K.L.? Christy. How do I pick her up? Susan. I'll bring her to you. Address? Christy. No, we will meet you somewhere to get her. Susan replied with two asterisks for no apparent reason. Christy. I need to have something in writing saying she is to be with me. We can meet at the police department. Susan. Never mind. Christy. Never mind? Susan, never mind taking her. Not long after that, Susan messaged Christy from another phone number, saying, I'll meet you at the police department. If you don't respond, I'll have to contact Tina, and if she doesn't want her, I'll have no choice but to take her to Randolph Road. Tina was K.L.'s birth mother, and by Randolph Road, Susan was referring to a psychiatric hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina. Considering Susan and Big John did that exact thing to Shane when she was a child, dropping her off at a mental hospital, it's no surprise Susan would bust out the same threat decades later. Christy responded, I'm coming. Now? Are you meeting there now? Susan, No, sorry. Was on the phone with social worker. Christy, Okay, are you meeting me at the police department to give me K.L.? Susan, K.L. talked to the social worker, told her she lied about everything. No, I can't, according to the social worker. As it turned out, K.L. actually had spoken with a DSS caseworker in the meantime. When the social worker called on the phone, Susan and Jean loomed over K.L., making sure she said exactly what they wanted her to say, including refuting her own claims of being abused at their hands. I'll pause here for a brief sponsor break.
The day after Susan's retracted offer for Christy to take her youngest sister, Christy was surprised to get a desperate phone call from K.L., who had snuck away and called her using Susan's phone. The following is over eight minutes from that phone call, which Christy recorded and which I edited only for time. I beeped out K.L.'s real name, as well as the names of one of Christy's sons and someone on K.L.'s support team. I saw I your... I tell you something. Okay, tell me something, baby. I'm really sorry for being such a bad kid. Honey, you're not a bad kid. I've always told you that. I've always told you you're not a bad kid. You've I made... just really want to come home. Honey, I want you home. Please know that. I'm so scared. I know, baby. What was something else happened? No, but you yeah. did get the part Jamie to say in the text, right? Yeah, Jamie told me what all you told her. Yeah, uh, and it, I think I sent you a voicemail earlier. There, she talked about medicines. Like, if there wasn't <laughs> any, I recognized, and I finally got to take a look at them. But mommy keeps them up, and um, there were two I didn't recognize. I'm sorry. It's fine. No, it's not fine. <laughs> It's not fine. None of this is fine. I hate that you're having to go through it. I know that it's really hard, and I wish there was something I could do. We just have to be a little patient and make sure that we do everything the right way. If yeah. somebody comes to talk to you, you need to be honest and tell I them. Know, but I'm so scared because what if I tell them the truth and I have to stay with mom and then something else goes wrong? I don't want to be hit or cussed at anymore. Honey, if you tell the truth, I can't imagine that they would make you stay, okay? okay? We have to, we have to tell the truth always. It's the only thing we have on our side is the truth. I know it's scary, but you are brave. You are a strong young lady and you know it. You are strong. And if anybody can do this, it's you, baby. I've tried calling you a few times this morning. I know. I saw it, baby. I was asleep. I was up late because threw up last night in the middle of the night, and I didn't. My phone must have fallen off the nightstand, and I didn't hear your calls. You know, I'm so sorry you had to move and stuff. It's okay, baby. It's okay. All of it's gonna be okay. We need to. Uh, Daddy's birthday. Like my mouth's been bleeding. Why? Why? Why do you have a bruise on your face? Didn't? Did you not get the text? Uncle Gene's been hitting me. He hit you in the face? Yeah, about four times. Jamie, I thought Jamie sent you the text. She, she did, but then I also talked to and said you told her that he didn't hit you. No, well, I didn't say he did it. I just didn't share that with her because I just felt more comfortable telling Jamie or you. Okay. Okay, I understand that. If you tell though, she's a mandated reporter and she has to do something about it. Okay, well, can you tell her? She has to hear it from you, baby. I can tell her. I did tell her. I sent, I, I sent her what Jamie sent me. But she has to hear it straight from you. Can you promise me that I'll be able to come home? I can promise you that I am going to do everything in my power to make sure that happens, baby. Why me? Why was I the one that had to be taken? I, I, don't, I don't have any answers, babe. I don't. Not right now. I know it doesn't make sense. I wish that I could. I, I wish none of this ever happened. I know, and I'm so sorry for being a crappy kid because oh, I regret you're it, but i do anything to come home. I'm so sorry for how I've acted horrible. Baby, I've you're... horrible, but i do anything to come home right now, and I promise I'll be on my best behavior. Baby, you're not a crappy kid. You're not. You're a good kid. And you're not away from me because you were bad. I hope you know that. You're away from me because some grown-ups made some really, really bad decisions. And I wish they hadn't. I really wish they hadn't. But the only thing we can do at this point moving forward is speak our truth, baby. You speak your truth and I'll speak mine. And we have a lot of people that support us. 
I just really want to be able to believe that I'm going to be able to come home. I know you do. And I want to, I want you to hold on to that belief so you have hope, okay? Okay. Everybody misses you very much. Very much. And we talk about you every day. It's not fair. I know, baby. <laughs> I miss you and I just want to hug you. I am too. <laughs> Nobody around here hugs me. Oh, I know, baby. You need to make sure that you tell people what is happening. Did you ever talk to your guidance counselor? She talked to me. She, um, she told yeah, me. I, I did, but the thing is, on June the, um, 9th, I'm going to Dr. And um, mom is coming up there, and I don't know what to tell him or anything. I don't know because she's probably going to be in the room with me and stuff, and... I don't know what to do. I, and she's trying to get me on court, like on the stand. She says if she have to, has to, she will. And like, and that's and fine because you can speak your truth. Just because she tells you to say things doesn't mean you have to, baby. But what if I don't get to come home? I can't and imagine. What if I have to go home with her? If you speak your truth and you tell them everything. You tell him about how you used to get the cold showers and how Humphrey used to bite you. How she's not the one that's taking care of you. If you tell them all of that. And you also need to tell them about how she would lock you in your room. I know. You need to speak your truth, baby. You need to... I know it's hard. It's scary because you're worried that she's going to do something if you talk. I know because I've lived that it's much. extremely scary because when it was with you, I wasn't afraid because you were there. But now nobody's going to be there that I know. And it's really hard. I know, baby. I am here, though. I am here and I'm always a phone call away. And I know that sucks. I know it seems like I'm really far away, but I'm not. I'm not that far. And I love you. I love you, too. You are so brave. Please don't put yourself down. Please don't call yourself bad. You're not. You are a good child. You have been forced to live in circumstances beyond your control, and I don't blame you for the way you've behaved. I love you, too. You know. This is probably oh, the hardest thing you've ever had to go through. Yeah, because I didn't expect it to happen, and I don't like being hit or cussed at. It hurts. Well, don't worry. We are taking the necessary steps. I, I, I don't want to get into everything with you, but just know that there are things that are being done, baby, okay? I know. It's just that um, I'm scared. I'm so scared. I've never been this scared before. I know, I know, baby. I, I, I'm scared and I'm a grown-up, okay? It's okay. okay to be scared. I know it doesn't feel good, but you are a beautiful, smart young lady. And you, I know it sucks. You've got this. You just got to be brave for a little bit longer, okay? Okay. And know that that we all love you and nobody has given up on you. Every one of us loves you, and we think about you all the time. And I'm so, so glad that you have reached out to me. But I have to go. All right, love you. I love you too. Bye. That call gave Christy the courage to call DSS again and beg them to help her little sister. Jamie also made a follow-up call, and the following day, on May 31st, KL's DSS caseworker went to Jean's home, accompanied by the police. K.L. was incredibly brave and told the caseworker and the police officers about the abuse she suffered at the hands of her mother and uncle. The caseworker recorded the visit, later telling Christy she was appalled at the way the police officers treated K.L. They practically interrogated the 11-year-old about the abuse allegations, repeatedly asking if she was sure that was what had happened and telling her it wasn't good to lie. Just as K.L. had feared would happen, after she poured her heart out during the DSS visit, she was forced to stay in Jean's home for two more days. Although K.L. was spared more physical abuse, 
Susan was particularly cruel during those two days, even insisting that the little girl she had raised since infancy immediately stop calling her mom. During those two days, K.L. spoke with Christy again, telling her big sister that Susan was calling around, trying to find her birth mother, Tina, so she could take back the daughter she abandoned shortly after birth. Finally, Christy sat down with the DSS caseworkers and a police detective and spent two hours laying out the truth about Susan, from making Shane sick for her first 28 years of life, to the accusations of Michael's and Kevin's murders, to her maltreatment of the children in her daycare, to her abuse of K.L. After hearing Christy's story, the detective asked how the hell Susan was able to adopt another child, and the caseworker admitted that DSS was responsible. However, she tried to excuse the agency's massive error by explaining that when Susan was accused of her two adopted sons' murders, she had a different last name than she did when she adopted her daughter. Fortunately, DSS at last removed K.L. from Susan's custody and placed her in Christie's home. Christie asked the caseworker to get some of her sister's belongings, but the caseworker returned with the unfortunate news that Susan had thrown all of it away. Again, this is sadly not a new tactic for Susan. When she was angry with her stepson, John Christopher, when he was a child, she used to go into his bedroom and start throwing things away out of spite. Although K.L. was relieved to be surrounded by a large, loving family, she had been through so much that she suffered serious adjustment and behavioral issues. As she became a possible danger to herself and others, her behavior became so concerning that DSS had to place her in a foster home two hours away. Christy was only allowed to speak with her a few times while she was in foster care but K.L. was miserable, begging to come home. No matter how much Christy tried to reassure her, K.L. was sure that Christy had given up on her, just like everyone else did. On November 3, 2022, Christy, Shane, and a couple of supporters attended a court hearing with DSS. Susan, K.L.'s legal adoptive mother, didn't bother to attend. I am positively thrilled to report that Christy was given full physical and legal custody of her little sister. Now 12-year-old K.L. was able to spend Thanksgiving in her new forever home with her big sister, brother-in-law, and their kids. There was one more special guest at Christie's place for Thanksgiving this year. For the first time in well over a decade, Shane spent the holiday surrounded by her family as well. Now I'll take one final sponsor break. In the next episode, you're going to hear from Susan herself. But don't worry, I haven't spoken to her personally, and I can assure you that unlike the Peacock streaming service and their recent documentary about the awful woman who gave birth to Kaylee Anthony, I'd never give a platform to someone who seems to have gotten away with their own child's murder despite being morally detestable in every way. What you're going to hear in Part 7 is audio captured by Susan's daughters during conversations with Susan both in her home and in the hospital, as she lay on her so-called deathbed. For the record, Susan is still very much alive. In those recordings, you're going to hear Susan putting on quite a show, taking responsibility for some of her past actions, while in the same breath making excuses for them. You're also going to hear Susan make several startling admissions about some of the things she's done, and by the time the episode is over, I think you're all going to wonder why the hell this woman isn't behind bars right now. My sources for this episode were medical records, court documents, audio and video recordings, and personal accounts. That's it for this episode. Join me next time for part 7, which will be the last part of the Groom to Die miniseries. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com. To help support the show, you can visit Patreon.com slash STLCPod or KO-FI.com slash STLCPod. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. 
All music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something.